this thing called MTA, if you want multi-touch attribution, what that means is, right, if I hear about a thing on your podcast, I Google search for the thing, but I don't convert. And then I see a Twitter ad and I finally convert. Guess what? All those three touch points contributed to that user converting. It's not the case that Twitter alone or the Google search alone contributed to that. Everybody, frankly, should get a share of that upside of whatever that is. In Web2, it would have been impossible to engineer. Literally, there's no way to do it. Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I wanna take a second to acknowledge Vouch. With over 4,000 startups insured from napkin sketch ideas to large IPOs, Vouch is the insurer of choice for crypto companies, including L1s, L2s, DAOs, protocols, and a whole lot more. Their exclusive coverages are enhanced for crypto, covering everything from regulatory defense to smart contract vulnerabilities. With Vouch, you're not just insuring your startup, you are investing in peace of mind so you can keep on building. You'll hear more about Vouch later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to Empire. We have Antonio Garcia Martinez, a uh, whole bunch of, who's done a whole bunch of things on the show, which I will describe in a second, but Antonio, man, welcome uh, welcome to Empire. Good to have you. Dude, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, your your bio leading into this, which is why I kind of like jumbled over that first part, but uh, I was like, do I describe him as a journalist? Do I describe him as like a founder? Do I describe him as like the first PM for ad targeting at Facebook? Do I describe him? But I think the way I want to describe you is like, I don't know. I think you've written the best ever book on ad tech, which was Chaos Monkeys. And I remember reading it uh, when we launched Blockworks 2017, moving into 2018, like trying to figure out the ad market and how it really worked. And there really weren't many books out there. So I remember reading Chaos Monkeys uh, and it helped a lot. So. You know, it's funny. You're not the only person to say that. And I often say it's easy to be superlative when you have no competition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yes, it's, nice. it's both the best and the only book on yeah, ad there tech you go. written in the past 10 years. There you go, man. So I wanted to have you on because... Um, I would like to make this like the definitive episode on when someone is trying to figure out like what the ad markets could look like in crypto. I'd like to make this like the episode that folks send to people. And the reason that I want to do this now is uh, the last episode we just did was on friend tech. And I'm sure you've seen friend tech and I'm sure you've seen like, I think kind of the social token narratives coming back, which also as that happens, you start to get like the web three social narrative comes back and that brings into question the business model of Web3 Social, right? And obviously the business model of Web2 is advertising. And so I want to, I think the most helpful place to start is with your background, actually, right? You started this ad tech company, you sold it to Twitter, you then joined Facebook, uh, became the first product manager for like the Facebook ad targeting platform. So why don't we start there, if you could just share that story, and then we can move into like how Web2 ads work, and then we can move into Web3. Sure. Yeah. So um, in the midst in the midst of ancient history, in 2010, um, just down the street from where I currently am in uh, San Francisco, Soma uh, district, I had a, a YC company in 2010. It was it was kind of focused on small businesses and, and ad tech. And as you said, yeah, it, it, it was an, what was then used to be politely called an aqua hire, which what it meant was the company was basically acquiring the you know, the, the brain power of the actual employees, maybe there was a small premium, but basically it was just like a juicy job offer and you could claim you sold your company. Um, not usually a huge success, to be honest, uh, which AgRock wasn't, but um, it, it was an interesting product. And as you said, I landed um, in Facebook in like early 2011, still a year away from the IPO. And still when Facebook's ad system, frankly, didn't work. Uh, one of the more shocking things I did when I got to Facebook, it's a, it's a scene in my memoir about a Chaos Monkeys. I go into the dashboards to look at what's called CPM. So CPM, for those who want to know about ads, cost per mil, mil, a fancy Italian or Latin word. I'm not sure why ad tech is using it, but basically the cost per thousand ad impressions. It's basically the cost per square foot of web inventory. And it's how every website from Facebook to the New York Times basically quantifies what it's worth. When you load the page and it shows you some form of sponsored content, how much, how much does the cash register ring? Right. And so I'd go to the dashboards and the CPMs were something like 17 cents, which is very low, comparable to the ads that you'd see on like blogs at the time, this thing called AdSense. Um, to give you a, a figure of merit, CPMs on Instagram's news, news feed, which are very successful ads, are more like eight, nine, ten dollars $10. So Facebook's monetization has basically increased two orders of magnitude in the past 10 plus years. And so obviously the ad system's gotten a lot better, but at the time it basically didn't work. And, and I'd like to claim that like Merrick got me, there was basically happenstance that had me land, um, you know, sketching out the targeting roadmap for Facebook in, in 2011. So why didn't the ads work? Um, well, A, they were very small. Um, they were not, new, there were no newsfeed ads at the time. There were these tiny little postage stamp things on the right-hand side that were basically really crappy. Uh, the targeting didn't work. Uh, basically you would target 
likes and interests, which you can still do inside Facebook. And basically it was the page likes. If you had liked BMW, you'd be part of the, the, PM, the BMW you know, targeting group. The, the first product we shipped, ooh, big innovation. We rolled you into a cars topic in which all the cars pages were mm-hmm. rolled into. That also didn't work as it turns out. And uh, this is one of the sort of misconceptions about how Facebook monetizes. Your user data, at least as regards what's on Facebook, isn't that helpful to actually target ads. Uh, Zuck's definitely not listening to your microphone. I know that's the rumor on Level Die. I'll, 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 people will always <laughs> believe claim, that. Bold claim, my friend. Bold claim, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, Zuck, if you're listening. The reality is that you rarely say anything on Facebook or even in the ambient air that would be heavily targetable. Like, when, when do I say I'm traveling to Boston uh, next week and want a ticket less than $600, right? Which would be targetable, but it, it almost never happens. And so uh, what we realized at Facebook is that in order to actually do do proper, I mean, there's a bunch of things that happened, right? Like the ads formats got better, newsfeed got better, there was video ads, et cetera. But part of it is we needed outside data outside of Facebook. The fact that you looked at a $400 backpack at REI but didn't buy it is actually a juicy piece of targeting data. And it turns out if we show you an ad for that for that bag, the, the click-through rate, the CTR, ad tech is all about acronyms, the CTR shoots up from 0.5% to 4%, right? And suddenly the ad kind of works and the CPMs go up by a lot. And so we discovered we had to do that. And so the Chaos Monkeys opens in the scene with me pitching Zuck saying, hey, like we have to link to outside data to enable some of this stuff to make it work. And, you know, they've built a lot, a lot of stuff since <laughs> since 2011. But that's part of how how the Facebook ad system started working. So my understanding of uh, the way that Facebook, both actually Facebook and Google, the kind of like hack, the key to getting this outside data was sign in with Facebook. Right. I remember like. I don't, sort of. I don't, yeah. So tell me. So what? So what? How did you go about getting that outside data? And am I right or wrong there? Yeah. Um, initially, no. So okay. again, in that scene, I hate to be the sort of writer citing their own do work, it, but it. it's, it's relevant to the story. In in that scene with Zuck, like the one, nobody really understand what we were doing. I was I was the one eyed man in the land of the blind, to be honest. Like I wasn't the expert here, but I, I knew a little bit about ad tech because I my one startup experience before Facebook, other than my own company, was a, as an ad tech startup. The one thing Zuck didn't let us do was touch what was then called platform, i.e. the like button. So the, 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 the real estate that Facebook had, now they do use it for ad targeting, by the way. The terms of service have changed. But at the time, they were very sensitive about Facebook Chrome stuff being perceived as monetization. So what actually happens, and again, this is part of the ad tech machinery you don't see, when you go to a website, uh, what are called pixels, like literally, it's actually not literally pixels anymore, but a piece of front-end code actually runs that syncs your browser session with outside parties that you're not looking at, including Facebook. Um, if you want to see it, there's this extension. I have no affiliation with it, but called Ghostry and uh, Ghost E-R-Y. You can use it. And what it basically shows you is all the pixels or all the ID syncs firing on the website you're looking at and where they're going to. And it lets you turn them off, by the way, if you want to. And so install it, go to the New York Times, which gives Facebook a lot of grief about how they make money. And you'll see like 30 odd pixels firing to everybody, including Facebook, by the way. Well, and, and so, why are they doing this? Why does... Why do they pass that data over to Facebook? This is one of the key parts of ad tech that people don't understand. They're all fixated on like microphones and bullshit. The, the key thing, one of the key things underpinning what my current company does and what I think what's going to happen in Web3, and we can get to that, is identity. What do I mean by identity? What, why, for example, is Apple's privacy maneuver is a big deal? And why is it hurting Facebook so much, which it is, right? For, you know, what is the nature of advertising? All advertising, whether it be a billboard or whether it be an ad that one day runs inside a Web3 game, right? What it's about is you have some initial touch point. The, the funnel is the metaphor that most marketers use. And you can imagine it being wide on top and obviously very narrow at the bottom. Top of funnel, if you want to use the lingo, things happen like ad impressions, you browsing your Twitter feed, checking out that Discord post, very initial touch points in this funnel. Maybe you click and engage with that content. You land on the advertiser site, the game developer, the decks, whatever. Maybe you engage with the content, maybe you do. Maybe you sign in with your wallet or you install the app. You're now mid-funnel, right? Then you start using the app and you start monetizing. You're making money. Now you're down funnel, right? The, the key challenge of much of marketing is tying together the top of funnel event, that Facebook ad campaign you ran or that Twitter influencer that plugged you to that end of funnel monetization event, whether that's happening on chain or off. At- attribution. That, that, that is literally the attribution problem, yeah. which I know sounds very wonky, but at the end of the day, it's basically answering the question, where did users come from? How did they get here? And how long did they stick around? And how much money did they spend? It literally right. is that. Right. And a, a lot of what Facebook also had to build, in addition to the targeting, is the measurement side of it. It's like, okay, <laughs> how well did it perform? Facebook had no idea. If you clicked on a Facebook ad in 2011, had no idea what you were doing on other websites and how well the ads were performing. Literally zero. No clue whatsoever. And so... 
one thing that took 10 years to develop in Web 2, and we're hoping, obviously, that it doesn't take that long in Web 3, is what's called real attribution, real measurement. Like, okay, I, I, gave, I gave Facebook $30,000 last month. <laughs> what was the actual resulting revenue, right? And part of the reason, not to shill my bags here a little bit too much, but you know, the company that, I, that I'm currently working at and whose offices I'm in, um, that's what they're trying to answer, right? Like a year ago, I got crypto pilled and I started talking to crypto companies. I'm like, I don't understand. How do you not know your, what's called LTVs, lifetime value, like the total value that the user generates inside your app? How do you not know what's called your CAC, your customer acquisition costs? How much did I pay for this user to come in? How do you not know your retention, i.e. how long do the user stick around? These are basic, basic growth metrics that are just like the most basic thing in the world that just basically didn't exist in Web3. Um, a year ago, and, and I, have now, a, I have a funny. Not to interrupt you too much there, but like I have, a, sure. I have a funny story there, which is um, you know, one of Blockworks makes money in a couple of different ways, but one of the ways that we make money is sponsorships and ads, right? So someone yep. like I don't know, Ave or Uniswap or Coinbase or whoever it may be might will run ads and sponsorships with us, and it was really frustrating in the early days, and even I'm I'm just starting to see a shift in the last like year that people are getting better about it, yeah. but in the first five years, it was really frustrating because someone might spend. 250k on an ad campaign with us and then we'd go back to them and we want to create case studies we want to talk about it with other customers and we'd be like hey how was the 250k that you spent i'm assuming you know and they're like oh we have yeah. we have no idea we, we we think it went well because we saw we you know we saw some we talked to some people and they heard about us through your thing but like yeah. tracking no we have no idea it's all, so i know so we'll talk about spindle in a little bit but wait so answer me that question of like right. why how did facebook go from it's it's all just Facebook data. You like a cars page, so we're going to show right. you a Toyota. To yeah. hey, you are now browsing on like, I don't know. You click this ad for like an office chair, and then you went to the site, and then you bounced off of it, but then you came back to it, and and then yeah. that gets attributed to the ad. How did they get all that off-platform data? So it, it's, a, it's a great question. So there, the, broadly speaking, there's two sides to that problem. One is the targeting problem, uh, right? And then. And, and so you, and Facebook data does get used, and I'll get into how it does get used in a second. And it's in ways that most users don't don't realize. So the, again, there's two aspects to it: targeting and attribution. On the targeting side, how does it work? There's this thing called if you really want to read about it called custom audiences. Twitter has a version called tailored audiences. Everyone basically copied Facebook once once the product actually shipped. What that means is getting citing REI for some reason, which is down the street. As an example, I'm a I'm a member. I'm a loyalty card member, so they know me pretty well. Um, if REI knows that you're part of the, the whales, to use NFT language or gaming language, that spent $10,000 or more, say, last year, here's the 1,000 users. What they worry about, what the actual like, sophisticated marketer cares about is how do I reach my users, right? Like they, if they're smart and they have the correct data info, which almost everybody does in Web 2, we're getting there in Web 3, they know how to reach them along the various channels. The question is, how, how well can I reach them? If I have my 1,000 whales, can I reach 700 of them on Facebook? If I literally give you their email addresses, Facebook, how many of those can you can you show an ad, right? And at least when this custom audiences product first launched, this match rate, as it's known, was something like sixty or seventy percent, which is way higher than potentially Google or something else. And so the the you and I, I'm the I'm the advertiser, you're the ad system or the publisher, and me saying I want to reach these thousand people, and you saying, you got it, bro, we can reach sixty percent of them. That's like thumbs up, great. That means that we can share an an identifier and target that set of people. Okay, what's the second half of that? It's almost like a yin yang thing to it. Okay, you show the ad to them and maybe other people. Now I want to measure and see, you know, how how well do those people monetize? Does it just if I paid you a thousand dollars to br to bring in those six hundred people, did they spend more than a thousand dollars? And if so, is it a positive ROAS return on advertising spend? Basically, the ROI that every marketer knows in their head, right? That's the measurement side of it. And how how does that work at a basic level? Well, if you're buying on the REI app, there's what's called an attribution SDK, basically uh, just snippets of code in which REI is basically saying, okay. This e-commerce event happened, branch metrics or apps flyer or Facebook. I'm just mentioning attribution platforms that sure. exist. And, and they basically take ingest those events. They run what's called the attribution compute. They figure it out where the user came from and they say, okay. They tally up all that money and they say, it turns out you generated $2,000 in revenue on $1,000 of ad spend. That is, you know, a 2x return on advertising spend. You made a hundred, you made a hundred or sorry, whatever I said, a thousand dollars and a thousand dollars we spent successful ad campaign. So there's the measurement component as well, right? And those two together, Targeting leads to ad campaigns, which get measured, which refines the targeting, which leads to more ad campaigns. And there's this like flywheel that just generates billions of dollars in Web 2 and doesn't quite exist in Web 3 yet for a bunch of reasons that we can get mm. into. Yeah. So what is the, so with, um, okay, so part of the, part of advertising is just joining a bunch of different disparate data sources. And Facebook realized like, okay, we have to take like Facebook data, but then combine it with a bunch of off-platform data sources. Yep. There has to be a, 
joining thing though. There has to be a, an identifier to a person. And again, I know we'll talk about this later in web three. It's probably the wallet. I would assume you would argue in web two. It's what the email address. It's an excellent question. It, it depends what type of advertising you're talking about. Um, it's probably the email in the case of a lot of e-commerce in terms of the like actual hardware specifics. There used, there used to be a thing called IDFA, ID for advertising, which is basically the, the device ID on an Apple device. Um, it's um, AID, Android advertising ID in the case of Google. You used to have a unique identifier on the device. If you've heard a lot about this whole privacy thing that Apple is doing and the fight with Facebook, what they basically did is get rid of the IDFA. And what that means is, again, if you're Facebook and I'm the advertiser and we're, I'm running an iOS campaign on iPhone, we can't agree on the common name for a user. So we can't actually do that tracking from the top of funnel to the bottom of funnel. We have to go through Apple, and I won't get into too much details, but Apple kind of fuzzifies it in, in, in a big way. In theory, for the sake of privacy, which it sort of does, on the other hand, it is the case they're building their own ad system. <laughs> so there's a certain competitive gamesmanship going on here as well. But if you destroy, I think what you're, you know, to use database language, it's a primary key, right? Like there's a primary key for that user within that medium. And that primary key in the case of mobile is basically going away. And it also is in the case of web, right? So cookies, right? Brave famously obscures a lot of details about the browser, doesn't accept cookies. Safari is also dropping it. So third-party cookies are basically going away on web as well. And so I, one of the interesting long-term advantages of Web3 and why I think Web3 marketing is going to end up becoming more sophisticated, frankly, than Web2, is you do have a blockchain equivalent of it called the wallet address, um, which can serve as that, that primary key instead. So the impact of Apple take, so the impact of Apple asking you to opt in or not opt in, they're basically giving you the ability to remove that primary key that joins yes. everything together. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And who gets impacted by that decision and the decision to you know, Safari and Brave and stuff like that, removing, removing cookies. Who is the like most hurt by this? Um, uh, often it's Google and Facebook or the ad networks. It's often the advertiser. Um, just taking a very, I was going to say oh, it's the advertiser, right? Because it it's means the advertiser. Can, yeah, they're, they're, their CACs are higher. Their customer acquisition costs is higher, which yeah. by the way, they're, they're passing the savings on to you. <laughs> and yeah. so as given that the marketing budget is part of their cost of goods sold, if their marketing costs go up, your costs go up. Yeah. So, yeah, everyone thinks it's such a good thing. But like the counter mm, to yeah. that is that, um, I don't know, it's kind of nice getting ads served to me that like are very relevant as opposed to getting, I don't know, now on Twitter right now, I'm getting served like the most irrelevant ads. I'm like, what is this thing doing here? Get out of here. I like getting served like my nice office chair ads. I like looking at those. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I, I love privacy as much as the next guy. And I use incognito mode occasionally to like see stuff on the, you know, on the browser without being tracked by everybody. But like, broadly speaking, ad tech paid for the internet or paid for the web two version of the internet. And bad ads actually are not very good user experience and some form of advertising will have to exist. And so at least that's how I'm rationalizing it to myself. Um, yeah. I, I do think Web3, by the way, does open up interesting new monetization avenues that aren't necessarily ads, where I think the ads will be a lot more interesting and engaging. It won't just be like a little square of like literally like a JPEG that you're kind of like ignoring. It could be ads can be defined much more broadly, right? To me, yeah. it's, it's, a piece of, it's a piece of targeted commercial media that presents some sort of call to action to a user. And that could be anything. That could be an NFT drop. That could be a token drop. That could be somebody in your Discord saying, hey, this new DEX is amazing, right? Like that's an ad in a sense, if they're getting paid on a referral basis or something, it's effectively paid media. So there's a lot of more interesting ways I think you can create ads in Web3. Again, I don't want to reproduce like the, the crappy ads that you see on Web2, yeah. but, some, but some form of commercial discovery has to exist for any sort of media ecosystem to like survive basically. So can you, so th this is another thing that we think about at Blockworks is like, just, I mean, the state of the ad market, right? Because we're, we're impacted by it. And one thing that we're talking about right now is like website ads, like just display ads. And if you look at historically, display ads have gone, the CPM year after year goes down. Every year, the CPM of display ads goes down. Can you just talk to us about like almost the state of web two advertising and like what's happening in that world and like why things are happening in the way, the way that they're happening? So, so you mentioned that acronym again, CPM. So just to remind everybody, it's, it's cost per mil, which is cost per thousand. Wild, wildly per confusing, right? <laughs> it, it, a little, I mean, I've gotten so used to it that like I just see the world that way. But yeah, yeah it's, it's um, but yeah, again, it, it's the cost per square foot. Like literally a thousand, you load, you know, you, your, your website gets served a thousand times. How much money did you make? <laughs> did you make three bucks or 13? <laughs> because the right. difference matters. And CPMs right? depend, uh, the, the like more niche audience that you have typically like the or harder to reach audience, the higher CPM. So like exactly. a Blockworks yes. podcast where we're reaching like real crypto professionals, very high CPM. Uh, CNN's website reaching like, I don't know, hundreds of millions of people, very generic right. audience, $2 CPM maybe. So 
Right. And, and, and again, getting back to the, squ- the cost per square foot analogy, it's like, you're, you're kind of like the rich part of town, right? Your cost per square foot, a condo in your neighborhood costs a lot more than a condo in CNN's neighborhood, right? Because the real estate's just more expensive because people looking at it, the human attention, to be blunt, is just worth more on your website than CNN. Um, but how does media get bought and sold? So ads, there's an interesting historical story here. Ads used to get sold CPM, right? In, in podcasting world, I think they largely still are, in which, you know, the publisher does a direct deal with the advertiser, say, and some old school properties like New York Times probably still have direct sales forces, right? And they probably still have what are called insertion orders in which they insert an ad into the page and stuff, which, by the way, comes from the print world. They used to insert things into the, the, IOs. Into the printing run. The, the IOs, right? This is very old school language. So that still works kind of, but how many ads and certainly the most performance oriented ads get actually paid for is what's called, I'm going to hit you with another acronym, CPA, right? Cost per action. And what does that mean? Instead of paying for the top of funnel action like splatter New York Times or the newsfeed or whatever with a million ad impressions, I'm just paying for the thing I want the user to do. So if they come in and register and, 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 and pay for the paid plan of my app, say, that is the A I want to drive. And I'm, I know that that user is going to monetize at an average of, say, $100. So I'm willing to pay, say, $60 to get somebody, Google, Facebook, the, the media machine, to get that user and get there which is great for the advertiser. It's not quite risk-free, but it's almost risk-free in the sense that like somebody else has to eat that risk. Like if the ad is poorly targeted or the ad creative sucks or if it doesn't show up on the mobile app, I, the advertiser, don't pay for those ad impressions. I only pay for the users who came in the door. So advertisers love it. You might ask, well, but why, why does the advertising machinery agree to get, even give you that deal? Doesn't it suck? Well, no, because you get to arbitrage, right? The, the difference between what you're paying the publisher, some CPM, right? And they just want to get paid a CPM, versus getting paid that CPA. In other words, if you can correctly target the ad, if you can make the ad perform really, really well, such that a lot of people click on it and a lot of people actually convert and buy the thing, you can make a lot of money in that delta between the $100 or whatever, $60 CPA you're getting paid and the $1 CPM you're, <laughs> you're paying to advertisers. There's a lot of money there. And that's why Facebook has, you know, whatever, 30% or 20% gross margins because the gross margins on that sort of ad business is, is actually very good if you know how to run the ads. And so a lot of the ecosystem has actually moved to more of the CPA world where you're not, you know, the advertisers doesn't even necessarily know where the ad is running or the specifics of the ad. All they know is that, yes, Facebook or Google brought me 100 new users this month. Mm. Um, and so, but again, that world only exists if you have some way of measuring, oh, the user came in and did the thing that I wanted to pay for, and that user belongs in Facebook. So as the, as the media models went from CPM to cost per click, which was Google for a long time, to cost per install, in the case of mobile, to cost per action, attribution had to go further and further down the funnel measuring all those events and kind of transmitting it back to the ad network and saying, okay, you actually drove this user. And so in the Web2 world, that took 10 plus years to happen. When I started in ad tech in 2008, Yahoo was still, you know, remember Yahoo? Yahoo ads used to be a, a big deal. And you used to pay $30 CPMs for like the banner ad on top of Yahoo Autos. Totally untargeted, not tracked very well, like not a, not a lot of logic there, but that's how much you'd have to pay. And then by the time that I was like leaving, you know, Facebook by whatever, 2013 or 2014, you already had the beginnings of some sort of CPA world in which mm. Facebook could only charge you for the performing ad. And But again, the, the attribution sort of train had to follow all that logic. In Web3, I think a lot of things are flipped. Like a lot of things in Web3 are just the, the mirror image of Web2. And I think one of the things that's weird is all the monetization events, we already have an attribution database. It's called the blockchain, right? I mean, it's hard to query and it's hard to organize the data and the data infra is very rudimentary by and large. But I know who actually bought the cryptocurrency or, 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 or bought the NFT or minted the NFT or did whatever swap on deck. Like I, I can see the bottom of the funnel better then I can see the top of the funnel, right? Web3 people, like you can run a query inside Dune that at least gets you a high level aggregate of what happened on the chain, even if you don't know where the hell they came from, right? And so the attribution challenges and the analytics challenges in Web3 are a little bit different than, uh, maybe mm-hmm. I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but it's, very, it's, it's a little different in Web3. In many ways, it's more advanced, frankly, than it was in Web2 when I, when I started in Web2. Yeah. Um, Why is the ad tech stack? Oh, so I went to this publisher conference a couple, uh, a couple months ago and uh, every sponsor was this like ad tech company. I was like, how many freaking ad tech companies are there? A so lot. I looked up, so I looked up ad tech ecosystem, like one of those ecosystem maps. I was like, I got to yeah. understand how all these guys sit. And it basically, it's like you got the advertisers over here, the publishers over here, at which and the publishers connect to the audience. And in between those folks, you've got the agencies, the media buying desks, the DSPs, the ad exchanges, the ad networks, uh, 
the horizontal ad networks, the vertical ad networks, you know, the, the, the DMPs, the media planners, the, the retargeting folks, the, the ad servers, the verifiers, the SSPs, the DSPs, so many measurement (laughs) platforms, the analytics platforms, the creative optimization folks, the brand safety platforms. Now, why, how has this world like this? It's an insane world. Yeah, yeah. So for those who haven't looked it up, there's a thing called the Lumascape, which was the original one. But now the Lumascape is a little dated. But if you go and you, you literally see a map of these logos organized by function, and it is literally thousands of logos. It is this blinding map of the world. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it. it's, you know, I don't know. It's 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 weird. It's, it's just, it's a very convoluted Rube Goldberg machine yeah. in which people just specialize in various parts of it. I just feel this, like this doesn't happen in other markets. Like when you look at how other markets develop, there are typically super disparate companies. And then over time, acquisitions happen, mergers happen, you know, economies of scale, like the best people just get even stronger. It doesn't, does it happen in the ad now? I guess, I mean, I guess Google has dominated, yeah. like Google dominates it. Yeah, it's not necessarily M&A consolidation, but there's been just revenue and budget consolidation. The, the vast yeah. bulk of the marketing spend still goes through Google and Facebook and all those little boxes like, the joke in ad tech is that like, yeah, we're the lifeblood of the internet and yet everybody's broke except Google and Facebook, right? So all those little boxes, they, they take kind of a cut as the data and the users flow through them, but it's often not a particularly juicy cut. Um, how, how many platforms is an ad going through before it hits the audience? If you're in like what's called the programmatic stack, like that 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 right. whole machinery, that it's, a, it's touching at least five or six boxes in that diagram easily. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and by the way, a, a little bit of that is happening in Web3 as well. We can get into that. But I think you're going to start seeing a little bit of that specialization on the Web3 side as well. Eventually, mm-hmm. I mean, you have to. You, you just can't, un, unless you are the Facebook, right? You just can't build it all. You can't vertically integrate the right, entire thing. Right. I have a couple more questions on Web2, then we'll, sure. then we'll do Web3 stuff. Sure. One thing is, um, why are you so convinced that Instagram is not listening to you? <laughs> well, first, well, A, like there's no value. I actually wrote a Wired piece about it that I always just like hit everybody with when they ask me. <laughs> For, right, we'll, for starters, we'll, link we'll link that in the show notes. Yeah. Also, secondly, you'd see it. I mean, it, in your network trace, you would actually see the equivalent of a voice call going to like the mothership 24-7 and you just don't see it, right? Like it would totally wedge your phone. Or it'd be running locally, but then like the amount of AI that would have to be happening in your phone, you'd see the CPU pinning all the time as Facebook sits there and runs like ML trying to parse your voice. And you see neither of those things. And again, leaving all that aside, the technical, it just doesn't make sense. Like in this conversation, how many things did we say that would have helped us target you an Instagram ad, almost nothing. Right? I told you that just, I want an office chair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Really, what what price range? <laughs> Out of curiosity, what yeah. color? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hmm. So you just don't, okay? That's interesting. I guess I guess it goes to I guess uh, everyone thinks all consumers think that their information that they share about themselves is more important than it really is. That, yes, the, the chapter on this in Chaos Monkeys I call the narcissism of privacy. Not that yeah. I'm anti-privacy. I, like obviously, I believe in the privacy and the Fourth Amendment and the whole thing. But I think a, a lot of the the disconnect and thinking about it is that people think that like the thing they'd most hate to have escape, like the conversation with your partner or something, is actually the least interesting thing to go commercially to any have. Like they don't yeah. care about that at all, <laughs> right? They care about things like your your Google search record. Maybe actually they would care about. Um, w- one place, by the way, your Facebook data does does get used um, is what's called lookalike targeting, which is kind of one of these underdiscovered things. What that means is getting back to the REI marketer example of like, what does the R- REI person want? Again, they've got their thousand whales. They know how they can target them on various platforms. What they want is like another thousand whales. Like, hey, Facebook, help me find another thousand people like these people. And so what happens is they upload that list of emails. They match five or 600 of them. And then you do what's called audience expansion or lookalike targeting. What that means is they use, so the fact that, I don't think we're actually on Facebook. We had our friends on Facebook, but say we were, and say we we had a lot of contact with each other. It's probably the case that we're in the same socioeconomic stratus and the same urban sort of consumption lifestyle. Like it may be the case that Yano is very similar to Antonio if Antonio actually shopped at REI. And so right. that sort of audience expansion thing does use your data, frankly. But it's less about like what you said in a call, and it's more about what is the sort of similarity metric among all the consumers in the United States, and that that is valuable. Yeah. And Facebook does does monetize that. Yeah, we use that all the time. At Blockworks is great. <laughs> oh, oh, you use look like targeting on on Facebook or on? Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, let's see. You got to imagine Zuck. Uh, got to imagine one of the biggest regrets that Zuck has is not owning a phone, huh? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, hmm. For those who are wondering, like, what the hell are we talking about? Um, it's been reported at this point, but they were building a phone. Yeah. And uh, it was when I was there. And um, the big fear, and you know, I think Zuck is very strategic in his thinking, is at the end of the day, seen from the point of view of 
Google and Apple, who are kind of mortal enemies of Facebook, Facebook is just like another app in the app store, right? They don't yeah. actually they don't actually own the user, and I think that's come to bite them. And it's it's true. If you control the hardware layer, you control the identity, you control how the ad system works, and uh, potentially, yeah, that might have been a mistake in retrospect. Do you think that um, so right now our data lives in the cloud? Do you think that data eventually goes back to living in hardware? And in this case, yes. not like you know big clunky hardware things, but like living on device instead of in the cloud. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, um, I was at a company, an attribution company called Branch Metrics. That's one of the leading attribution companies. And the reason why they hired me was not to work on the attribution system, it was to build an ad system. And mm -hmm. the idea there was to, we kind of accidentally discovered it, but it, it was pioneering work. We built an ad system that actually lived on device. And what that mm -hmm. means is like even turn off wireless, like search for a thing in the search bar and you'd be served a search ad because the, the matching and, and the actual ad unit was actually loaded on your phone. And then Apple, again, you can can read the public pronouncements and, and read read through the lines there a little bit. They're building an on-device version of that ad system, supposedly because it's more private, which it sort of is. The the data doesn't have to leave the cloud. That said, it's also a better way of targeting in many ways. If you actually have all the all the ads matching ML and logic, and you have all the ads metadata on the phone, it actually works better, it loads faster, and it's, just, mm. it's, it's a better it's a better ads experience actually. So yeah. if you're willing to undergo the complexity of like preloading the ad system, pre-optimizing it, sending it to the phone, having a bunch of ML run locally. It's actually a better experience for the user, and you can tell the privacy story. And to be blunt, you can screw the Facebooks of the world mm. who have a cloud-based ad system. So yeah, no, that's mm. pretty clear. That's the way forward for them. Why do you think Apple hasn't just launched an ad network? Oh no, they have. They have. I mean, I I, I briefly worked there. They all built it. I mean, they they they. I mean, they have a. If you go to Apple Search Ads, if you go to your Universal Search inside inside the iPhone, you'll see really. Paid, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, what's okay. the, what's I mean, the, what live demo. I, I can't believe I'm like demoing an Apple's search experience, but um, go to uh, oh, ch office here, here we go. Yeah. So I entered taxi, thinking it would be taxi apps, and there's Taxi Driver 3D uh, is one of the things that showed. Yeah, there's a commercial mm. content there. They make billions of the thing. Yeah. I did not know that. Hmm. I guess they do in the App Store too. You can spend. A, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, let's get to crypto stuff. Um, let's get to the fun stuff. So what is the state of like crypto marketing today and just like the ad markets in crypto today? I mean, if you had asked me that question a year ago, I would say non-existent other than like NFT drops and token drops, which again is a form of, of paid user acquisition. I think things have improved a little bit between my company and a couple others. Um, you, you do start having some real measurement. And what I mean by measurement is somebody tweets a thing, they click on the thing, they go to the decks, they sign up with the wallet, they spend money. And you actually track all that together. Yes, you can now. Actually, you have you have basic measurement, and you um, can track like web to ad to a uh, you know Dex user basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. Um, yeah, and then not only can you do that, um, one of the interesting things about Web three marketing um, is this whole fixation with referrals, right? And what that means is it's kind of like affiliate marketing with like Amazon. Like I give you a link, right? Because I'm an influencer. You go and trade on the Dex and generate a thousand dollars in trading fees that goes to the treasury or whatever. I get. 10% or 15% or whatever right. of that, which is pretty juicy, actually, if you think about it, right? Like the amount that a given trader can trade on on the DEX can often be pretty high. And so me getting 10% of that spend is actually material. And so th that referral, it's built in a very affiliate model, but you often see it in ways that are kind of B2B. So for example, you can just see this. If you go to CoinGecko, they have a, they have referral links on their on their site. So if you go to GMX, for example, um, the, the GMX page, and you go to the website page, that's actually a referral link. So CoinGecko actually makes money off of the GMX referral program and other referral programs. Um, you also have aggregators. So Quenta, for example, sends traffic uh, to Lyra and Synthetix and other ones, and they make money off that referral program. And so you're, which by the way, it's like totally legit, right? Like it's, yeah. I mean, if someone's upstream of me and sending users my way and those users actually monetize, right? Like measurably on chain, you should get a cut of that, right? And it's, believe it or not, like, some things are rudimentary in Web3, but their native thinking is actually quite sophisticated, right? There was nothing like this. There still is nothing like this in Web2, right? Like the, the attribution system in Web2, like if, if a user sees a Facebook ad and a Google ad and they come and spend money inside my app, I can't pay both Facebook and Google, right? The system forces you to pay. Right, you can only pay the most recent point of attribution. Right, but I exactly. what you're saying. In crypto, you can actually start to yeah. pay out across the whole attribution stack, which is actually like this holy grail of advertising, basically. Yeah, exactly. This thing called MTA, if you want multi-touch attribution, what that means is, right, if I hear about a thing on your podcast, I Google search for the thing, but I don't convert. And then I see a Twitter ad and I finally convert. Guess what? All those three touch points contributed to that user converting. It's not the case that Twitter alone or the Google search alone contributed to that. Everybody, frankly, should get a share of that 
upside of whatever that is. In Web 2, it would have been impossible to engineer. Literally, there's no way to do it. In Web 3, it's not that hard at all. Like we, So we have a, a, a referral program that basically takes the attribution. Like say you shared a link on, not to totally pitch you inside your own podcast, but if you were to share spend the link for some referral program, the users would engage with it, go to the thing, you'd get a piece of that action. And it could not just be you, it could be somebody else as well. Because our smart contract mm-hmm. can pay out to whoever get, whoever touch points along the way. So I think you're, you're going to start seeing a lot more interesting, exactly, and that's a holy grail of, of Web2, right? I think you're going to start seeing a lot more interesting models and in monetization in which it's much more fair, it's much more transparent to everybody, right? The user, the advertiser, the publisher, everybody, in which, yeah, everyone gets a little kickback for having driven that user action that drove like real value. Yeah. yeah it's, so is it fair to say that the two main um, like advertising mechanisms right now in crypto are NFTs and NFTs and token drops. I'd put that in like one bucket and then yep. referrals, referral links. I mean, the other one is questing. You can't, questing is a form of uh, yeah. ad effectively. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know what questing is, they used, it's funny, a lot of things Web3 are just basically reinventions of Web2 concepts. There used to be a thing called offer walls, which is basically quests. What a quest means is you can go to layer three or galaxy or other providers and it's like, oh, hey, go do these four things that kind of get you a little bit down the funnel and help you engage with this product. And if you like it, you'll stick around and spend more money. And it's kind of a very engaging ad unit. Again, ads very loosely sort of defined. And they're getting some traction. And we've, we've actually published case studies with Layer 3 um, about, you know, questing studies. And, you know, the users retain. They, they, you, can, you, pay, you pay for the quest, by the way. You, but the users monetize more than that. It's positive ROAS. Hey, happy, happy. Like, it actually worked. So, yeah, I would, I would say it's drops, which is basically just like, firing money out of cannons and hope, hoping people walk in the door because of the noise of the cannon and like picking up money from the ground and walk into the store to quests, which are kind of like sort of ad units. Uh, and then there is some Web2 marketing going on, right? Like there are people spending money on Twitter and conventional ads trying to drive them into Web3 games and stuff. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but like Web3 native, that's, that's about it. All right, everyone, wanted to talk about Vouch again, our favorite insurance provider for crypto companies. If you are building in crypto, you have probably come to realize that contracts need insurance, partners demand insurance. And as a founder myself, trust me when I say you owe it to not only yourself, but your investors and your clients and your customers. And I'm not just talking about any insurance. Their exclusive coverages are tailored specifically for crypto companies that can address issues like protections for regulatory defense, recognizing DAOs as insured, addressing smart contract vulnerabilities, and even covering the loss of digital assets. They're in it with you, whether you're working on L1s, L2s, DAOs, MPC wallet providers, building a protocol, and a lot more. So whether you're just scribbling your next big idea on a napkin or gearing up for a big fundraise or maybe thinking about that IPO or an acquisition, don't leave things to chance. Get insured today with 5% off Vouch's exclusive coverage for Empire listeners using code Empire. Think about it this way. With Vouch, you're not just insuring your startup, you are investing in peace of mind. Hey everyone, we'll get back to Empire in just a minute, but before we do that, I wanna let you know that we have Permissionless coming up. Permissionless is big conference that Blockworks and Bankless put on together. It is the biggest, the best DeFi conference in crypto. This year, it is in Austin, Texas, September 11th through 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that bear market conferences are the best kind of conferences. We have a phenomenal lineup of speakers. A lot of the guests that you hear on Empire are both going to be speaking there. You will have the opportunity to meet them there. And a lot of the topics that we cover on Empire, ZK Tech, Rollups, Account Abstraction, MEV, App Chain Thesis, a lot of that kind of stuff that will all be discussed at Permissionless this year. So because you are a listener of Empire, you get a special discount. That's right, Santi and I negotiated with our marketing team. You get 30% off if you go to blockworks.com forward slash permissionless. Empire 30 is going to get you 30% off your ticket. Today, when I'm recording this, that's about $300 off your ticket. So type in Empire 30 when buying your permissionless ticket, you get about 300 bucks off. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. It's in the show notes. Do it quickly because prices go up all the time. And if you are going to Permissionless, hit me up, let me know, shoot me a DM on Twitter. I would love to meet up with you there. Yeah. So what you're describing though, like, I don't know, someone clicks a link on a Blockworks newsletter and they get driven into Uniswap. What yeah. you're saying is like, now for the first time ever, Uniswap can contract that. But in my yeah. mind, I'm kind of like, so what a little, I mean, it's good for us, right? Cause we can like, I don't know, we'll get more renewals or something, but like, 
it's not that big of an advancement. That's that's no different than like, I don't know, REI tracking like that they ran an ad in our newsletter and someone bought someone bought something. But it does sound like you're saying, look, there's going to be a thing that comes after that, which is this like multi-touch attribution because everything lives on this like open chain. Is that am I reading it the right way? Well, I. I, I mean, you might be underselling it a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 amazing that in the span of basically a year or or not much more than that, <laughs> Web three has speed run like fifteen years of Web two ad history and gotten to the yeah. point where you can yeah. share a link and get paid for it. Like that that didn't exist in two thousand five. Like not in any way, shape, or form. It didn't exist in two thousand ten. Basically, like it'd yeah. be very difficult for you to monetize that newsletter of yours mm. um, in a very ad centric way. So, I mean, yes, we're not quite yet there, but almost at feature parity with Web two. But it, it took them twenty years to get there. Web three right. got there in a year or two, right? So like, <laughs> this is this is good news, right? right. But but I, but, I, but but I agree with you. In the in the in the, in the next world, right? In the, in the next iteration of this, um, once everybody has spindle, or once everyone has like real measurement uh, of some form or another, um, I think you're going to start seeing exactly the interesting multi touch models, which are a little bit different. I think the, the good thing about it is that like. Once we start having Web3 consumer, right, we have like wallet aware experiences, right, whether they be literally Coinbase wallets or what or you know, wallets, Web3 experiences that exist on chain, you're going to start seeing the ability for them to monetize particularly well. Because an interesting thing about Web3 is that LTVs, like lifetime value, the, the average value of, of a user is higher than Web2 by and large, at least from mm -hmm. what we've seen, right? Like the amount that like a whale user dumps in a DEX is stratospheric. It could be tens of thousands of dollars. Like right. if, there's... There's, there's, we, we actually had that. that. We actually had that one time in 2020 or 2021. We said we um we had one of our podcasts had a referral link in the show notes to like Bybit or like I don't know. So you know one of these exchanges and it you know we we hit it. We had we hit like a jackpot whale or something. And I was like, all right, here we go. And then one day it stopped and like paid us every month until it stopped. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, let's get into that because that's yeah. But that's but that's the reality of right. Like the LTVs are super high. DAUs can be low. But again, getting back to the lesson of CPMs, fine, low DAU but high LTV. The CPMs can actually still be pretty healthy if yeah. you've got significant monetization. And the, let's let's analyze why did you lose your uh, referral bonus? Probably I don't know the details of the program. Maybe it was intentional. But what often happens, particularly, you know, there's examples out there like like GMX is a is a good example in which the that user might have gone in and used a different referral link and your ref ID tag on chain got overwritten. And even though like you should probably claim for such attribution forever, at least as long as mm. the window, they simply don't have the attribution logic to do it. Of course, in our referral product, you would. But in the case of a lot of these homebrewed uh, referral products, like literally your ref ID just gets fucking hammered by the next transaction and then that's it. <laughs> your money goes away. Yeah. Even though, frankly speaking, you onboarded the user and not the next guy. But that's, you know, that's one of the things we're, we're hoping to improve. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is going to be um, like on-chain to on-chain referrals. Like, let's say, um, let's say I use like Zapper or Zerion or something. And like, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm in, I was in, actually I was in Zapper and Zerion both earlier today. And um, I was trying to see if either of them had the ability to like lend or borrow directly inside the platform. And you couldn't do it, but you can like, you can like swap inside the platform. And the way that they do it right now is like, they have a native integration probably with something like Paraswap or something like that. But you could also yeah. imagine a business model where like they send you out. Um, oh, that model exists. Can... Yeah, I mean, oh, uh, yeah. If, if, you, if, you trade, if you trade Lyra on Quenta, just Lyra is a spindle client. Right. So I'm just citing yeah. an example I know. Plug it. Plug it. Um, <laughs> a lot of their inbound comes through Quenta and Quenta is basically an aggregator, kind of like Gem is an aggregator to OpenSea and every, also another sure. spindle client. Yeah. And like they're sending value down funnel and in the case of Quenta, they are writing it on chain and they are getting paid mm. for that. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, so when we talk about referrals, I think the individual affiliate model, like it'll be there, but that's actually not going to be the bulk of it. I think it's, it's, it's going to be one big aggregator upstream sending value downstream and getting paid for it. That's platform the real the platform. Yeah. yeah. Platform I mean, platform here, here's, an, here's another platform. example of where this could be is, uh, you know, who could build a huge ad network? Coinbase. Base. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Um, that's really, some of us hope they do. Some of us hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us hope to be involved in that. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we've, we've actually, we've actually got a base case study dropping either this week or next. As oh, nice. I do uh, remember you, 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 me and, um, and Jesse from base were hanging out in Denver. That was the first time I think you and I met in person. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be public, so whatever. And it, it's already public because they announced it, but so layer three is running a bunch of quests for a bunch of dApps that launched for this on-chain summer thing. And we're going to be measuring a lot of them and doing a case study with them. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. We'll see when it drops. Probably so. Next week. Uh, okay, so if there's ad tech, there have to be ad marketplaces. 
Will, I'm curious if you think that these ad marketplaces are going to be open or closed. Um, and maybe if you could explain the differences between those two things as well. No, we've been we've been thinking about that a lot, actually. Um, yeah, what what does here's a question for you, you know, like what does the uniswap of user growth look like? Like what does it mean, right? Because an ads marketplace, again, to be very mercenary and cold-blooded about it, is literally a marketplace in human attention, right? I'm a publisher, right. I have attention and I want to turn it into money. I'm an advertiser, I have money and I want to turn it into human attention, right? That little yin yang is the dialectic that rules all in an ad system. So what is that, what does that look like in Web3? Um, I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be at least partly on chain for sure. It's going to be composable and permissionless. It already kind of is. So when we, when you started, refer, just as an example, when you started a referral campaign inside Spindle, that actually is an on-chain smart contract in which there's enough metadata there for you to potentially do something and aggregate that demand in an interesting way, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that you don't necessarily have to use our API, even work with us. I, in fact, I think uh, CoinGecko actually generated ref ID and then generated an ad creative and just ran it. They didn't even tell us. They just ran a piece of ad creative, put our Spindle link on it and like, all right, permissionless advertising. We're now advertising, I forget what it was. I think it was Lyra. Um, on CoinGecko. It's like, wow, that's interesting. Can you do it both ways? Could it be the case that the publisher says, you know, put something on chain. Okay, I'm a publisher. These are the sort of users that tend to come to me. This is the mm -hmm. ad format I support. This is my minimum CPM. Go, right? And that exists on chain in a very transparent way. And there's an attribution system that actually tracks this publisher led to this advertiser getting this much revenue, pay them, et cetera. Like, yeah, you can start seeing the makings of that emerge. Uh, the question is, like, on a protocol level, how is it tied together, right? AMMs are off, obviously very automated in the sense, oh, you've got a liquidity pool here, and you've got this much demand for Ethereum versus whatever, and then it all kind of magically works with EVM. What does that look like in ads? And I don't think anyone's quite figured it out yet, but I think it's going to look something very similar to that. Mm -hmm. So Facebook has this close. Is there, is there a better model? Like Facebook's? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, well, is it right that Facebook's marketplace is closed, closed and Google yes. is open, right? It's open. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the fights that I fought and lost uh, at Facebook. Um, people who've read Chaos Monkeys know the, the little mini dramas of my career. But at the time, Facebook was undecided. Like one of the products I had launched was the, what's called the programmatic ad exchange. What that means is for those who are wondering what the hell is programmatic or real time, it's kind of like Michael Lewis's flash boys in the stock market. When on, on in Google's ad system, when you load a page or you load a uh, an app, what, what happens is, and you don't realize it because it's happening billions of times a day like that, but what are called bid requests go out to advertisers. Basically, I load a page, it hits the ad exchange, the ad exchange says, oh shit, this person showed up, they sent out a bunch of requests to a bunch of what are called DSPs, basically ads buyers, or pieces of software that buy ads, they return with a bid, they rank the bids, they serve the ad, boom, and then they do it again a billion times a day. So that's the Google model. And anybody can kind of plug into that huge dataverse. I mean, it always seems to work better when you use Google boxes instead of other boxes. But in theory, there's other boxes and it's an open ecosystem and it's a little bit more transparent, even though, of course, Google bakes in its own advantages. In the Facebook case, I mean, there used to be a thing, FBX, that was my baby, but that eventually got shut down. How it works now is you have to upload your targeting data. Okay, here's a list of emails. And then Facebook does it all and you kind of, you don't really get a lot of transparency into what's going on other than eventually knowing that, okay, Facebook sent you 10 users, but which ad got served, which ads, where did they appear? You, you know, nothing about that. Facebook handles all of it. So yeah, it is very much a walled garden and it's just, um, it's a, it's a model that all the other social networks have followed. So Twitter is very similar. LinkedIn is the same. Snap is the same. They just philosophically, culturally, I think just don't look at the world very differently than Google does. And they like keeping things in their own, little, yeah. in their own little. The one disconnect I'm having here is, um, so in traditional world, like you fund an account, right? You might fund yeah. Twitter or Facebook or whatever it may be. Uh, you deposit the budget somewhere and then like you put in your campaign details and your creative and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of gets yeah. sent out to the world, often to publishers and different places. But the thing that, you know, is a requirement is if, is for a publisher to have a place for that ad to sit, right? Correct. Where is that ad sitting on chain? Good question. Did you, if you want to come over to the office, so we've got a whole diagram. We're trying to figure it out on the whiteboard. <laughs> well, I'm also trying to like, well, in, in, my, in the back of my head, I'm trying to figure out like how this applies to Blockworks, obviously. And like yeah. a lot of our revenue comes from advertising. So I'm trying to figure out yeah. how this helps us too. But All right, so... So one disconnect here is that like the natural clock cycle of ads, which is like literally real time millisecond is way too fast for any blockchain. So I don't care whatever blockchain L1 claims that it's got a TPS high enough. The real time ad exchange world is just at, at, at branch. We used to ingest something like 300,000 QPS, i.e. events per second. That's 
that dwarfs all of Web 3s transactions per second put together times five. Right. Right. So I like, don't think people ad- realize that the ad markets are so similar to the stock market, and they also they trade. Yeah. They, I mean, you trade them, and people That's they right. trade on not just like quantitative data, but also Elon takes over Twitter. People don't advertisers yeah. like CMOs don't like Twitter don't like Elon. So like the price of an ad dollar yep. on Twitter is going to fall. Um, there's yeah. there's momentum in the ads markets like there are in the equity markets. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, but the ads markets are super fast. So like, how does that shit live on chain? It's a lot of it's not going to live on chain. So like, when the publisher loads the page, you have to have a publisher SDK that serves the ad that just serves the ad in real time. You can't hit something on chain or do anything on chain. And so a, a lot of the real time aspect can't live on chain. But I think if you think about a lot of the other state that goes into an ads buy, like, okay, here's my budget. I'd like to leave that ad on for three days or this, you know, the number of ads that you would see navigating a given website isn't that high, right? It's not like thousands of different ads. So if you actually break it down to the state that doesn't change that fast, a lot of that could live on chain. And then Mm -hmm. specifically the performance data and how they get paid, that obviously natively has to live on chain because again, that's, that's the exciting thing about the blockchain, right? Like, again, going back to branch, what, example of a web attribution platform it's it's sitting there getting this fire hose of events and shuffling data around to everybody why not just have one database for it that everyone addresses and that's exactly what you have in web3 you don't need to send you know hundreds of thousands of server to server pings every second forever right. to make the system work you've just got one system but yes the, the big question is what fraction of that data lives on chain versus doesn't yeah. mm. who is going to be the master of the so you guys are building like a branch right S- Sort of, although it's getting bigger than that, right? Because we've got the referral side, and then who knows how much, yeah, <laughs> how far the little fingers yeah, will go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, who's going to be like so- the master of the ads in in what? Like, I don't know. Here, let me let me run a couple by you. Like, you, sure. I mean, you could. See, we just talked about the ba- like base base network and Coinbase. Like, they could be the master of the ads. Yes. Uh, you yes. could see another world where like the Solana phone ends up being like the master of the ads. Like, who do you think ends up being the master of the ads in crypto? Yeah, I've often asked myself, like, who's the Facebook and crypto? I know that that might come off as a as a negative uh, connotation. As a former Facebooker here, who literally has Facebook posters in the office, we'll call it a positive comparison. thing. I think uh, okay, yeah. we'll call it positive things. We we literally have the move fast and break things poster in the, in the office. Um, yeah, who would be the Facebook and crypto? I mean, obviously, I think Coinbase has a very strong vision there. We're very pro base. Um, the the chain they they obviously have a by Web three standards a huge number of MAU through the wallet. They have the Coinbase.com experience. Uh, they have a questing platform. They have a small ad system. If they actually make that work, if they make the L2 take off and they have whatever it is, 10 million MAU or whatever, I don't even know what the number is, but something around there and actually point that at a chain, dApps actually start getting, um, you know, start getting engagement. You actually have some some ability to actually promote growth in that Coinbase wallet experience, whatever. I think that could be very, very interesting. And I, mm-hmm. yeah, I think they have all the makings of like a real consumer ecosystem in Web3 in a way that like nobody else has all the pieces under one roof. And so we're we're very excited about it. Um, yeah. yeah. One thing that we talk a lot about in like DeFi world is uh, like just cross, I don't know, just cross chain liquidity basically. And this, this convert, you know, if you think about an ad market, like a stock market or like a crypto market, uh, you have to think about like ad liquidity actually. And, um, and then yeah. it makes me think about, you have to tie that into like uh, ad attribution as well. So how do you think about uh, cross chain attribution? Oh, it's hard. So, uh, I don't know if it's public yet, but whatever. <clears throat> One of our customers is Axelar, who's a, who's a bridge. Oh, yeah. And uh, man, was it hard as shit to do, to be blunt. I mean, it, <laughs> we, we spent a month trying to, trying to get them on board. I'm sure we'll do a case study about it or whatever. It's just, you know, knowing that you go from chain A to chain B is, a, is just a hard measurement problem. And then particularly if you look at, like, what is the usage pattern for bridging, you know, maybe they're doing a quest in which they, they bridge, you know, from qu- chain A to chain B to go do a thing, and then they bridge back, right? And so it's actually like a round trip. and do you count that twice or do you see that as one user journey? You've obviously got, by the way, however many chains, I don't even know exactly off the top of my head, is our Axelar, it's dozens at least. Right, right. And so you've got this, you know, covariance matrix of dozens by dozens <laughs> potential interactions that you have to render in some usable way. There's just a lot of interesting challenges on the, the cross the cross chain thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was that was an interesting uh, case for us to, uh, to actually work on. Um, there's something else you said that I actually wanted to, uh, to, to fix it on. Um, oh, the liquidity problem is an interesting one. Um, yeah, again, if, if you're thinking about like, what's the real web three D gen ad system, like, how does it work? What is the liquidity problem? What do you need cash for? Well, what you need cash for is actually to run ads budgets is what you need it for. Right. Cause w- one of the interesting things about web three, that is again, very different than web two and web two, I pay, I pay Facebook 30 bucks for the user. Right. I, I kind of own the user, the 
the user comes in and uses my app and they spend 70 bucks and they turn out and that's the full lifetime. That is, that is a full, that is experience. I pay for the user. I own them. I kind of milk them. They disappear. End of web three doesn't work that way. You don't buy users. You kind of rent them in the sense that like either you have to constantly pay them rewards blur comes to mind for them to stick around or promise them rewards for them to stick around. Or you're in the, like in your case, right? You, you're getting paid for the user that you brought in almost like an annuity, like a bond, like literally 10% of this guy's revenue was being paid to you in like regular installments. Yeah. It was like an annuity. And when you stop getting the installments, you're like, what the hell? Right? So like there wasn't a singleton CAC, it was an ongoing thing, but that raises a problem, right? The monetization in web three is an ongoing thing, like a coupon payment on a bond. However, if you're working with traditional publishers, they expect to get paid up front for media, right? So yeah. either you convince them to take a rev share or you pay up front. And so you have a liquidity mismatch between the oh, capital being paid. Mm -hmm. So then how do, you, how do you float that? Well, there could be interesting solutions to that. That is really interesting. Yeah. Very applicable to BlockWorks' business, actually. So are you firing a, um, are you firing a, uh, an attribution event every time someone's writing on chain? Like... You guys must be firing a crazy amount of attribution events, huh? Well, so it's or, a good question. Can you explain Pindle? Like, can you explain actually a yeah. little more about like the details of how yeah. Spindle works? Happy to. We're we're totally we're totally bold in public. So go, go to our blog, cool. blog.spindle.xyz. If you care about privacy and all that stuff, we talk about it publicly. We're we're very public about how we build, and there's nothing like weird or shady going on. So um, on the Web two side, it looks pretty normy. I mean, it's like Branch or like Google Analytics, right? Like you go and you fire a page view when you go and you look at the page. Like it's not that strange and weird and it looks very Google Analytics-y. Where it gets a little weird is when you sign in with the wallet and you go on chain and you start doing stuff and you're kind of out of web too, right? So what do we do there? I mean, in my opinion, to be blunt, and not that your question was dumb at all, but just to, like the the very, what, what people tried doing before Spindle existed is actually trying to fire events and mimic double entry bookkeeping, what's happening on chain with a Web2 system. So they would fire events into a conventional Web2 attribution system to mimic what's going on chain because they had no alternative, right? But that's kind of like, it's almost, I wouldn't say the dumb way to doing it, but it's a very hacky way of doing it because you're never going to keep up, like it's, it, you're never going to keep up with what's happening on chain. They, they, mm -hmm. they would in fact drop events and not see what's going on. The smart way to do it, which is a hard way, um, is actually indexing the subgraph correctly and measuring what's happening on chain correctly and backing that into the revenue number that you care about. That's how we do it. And so we, we track the Web 2 stuff in a very Web 2 way, and then we track the Web 3 stuff in a fully Web 3 way. And then we, we join that in a different way, but that, that's how we do it. So we don't fire, we, we fire events to ourselves, but the advertiser is not firing anything to us that's happening on chain. They don't need to do anything. In terms of integration uh, hassle, it's fully yeah. on us. So if, if you were fully on chain like a DeFi protocol, you would literally need nothing to integrate with Spindle. We would do all the, the heavy lifting of, of indexing stuff on mm. chain. Do you pay out on chain? Yes, you have to. The, the The marketing budgets are usually a native token on chain. Yeah. They're not going to pay in fiat. They're they don't. The DeFi protocol doesn't have the reflex of shoveling twenty k a month to Facebook. It's, they just doesn't exist. They, you, it has to be natively on chain. Yeah. So oh. our referral smart contract, our attribution is centralized and off chain because the compute is just too fast and there's too much going on for it to be on chain. But that gets paid in a very oracle-y like way to a smart contract that then does pay natively on chain. Yes. Huh. Yep. That's really cool. That's really. Which, cool. I mean. Uh, Again, we don't believe in decentralization as religion, but we, we do think there's a proper Web3 way of building things. And we do, you know, we, we try to, we strike what we hope is the right trade-off, but to the extent that it should live on chain for the sake of being transparent, composable, permissionless, we do build on chain. And for the, the extent that which it's like, it's a complicated compute, it would be expensive to put on chain, we don't. And so, you know. Hmm. What is it? Why is, why is this the, hmm, what's my question here? Is this good? Is this like, do we need ads? Yeah. And why are why are ads good? I have I have many thoughts, by the way, as an ad business. But like, why are why do you think ads are good? Because I think the reality is that a lot of consumer use cases are not going to be supported through anything other than ads. As a matter of fact, a lot of the consumer, a lot of web to consumer wouldn't exist without ads. Which I don't know. Like, hey, I'm a I'm as much of a letter as the next guy. I used to use Pine for email twenty years ago, and I thought it was a great email client. <laughs> that said, I still use Gmail now. So, um, and again, I think you have to define ads very, very broadly. It's not necessarily showing you like a square of some shitty thing that you're ignoring on a consumer experience. It's like your favorite influencer who maybe is a tastemaker in some part of crypto you, you care about is getting paid for that influence in a way. They are a publisher, right? They're a decentralized publisher, similar to your podcast, right? People pay attention to what, what you know, you, you influence a lot of perception in crypto. And if you drive users to a certain depth, then 
I don't know, you should, you should get recompense for that. If you weren't getting paid for that, this podcast wouldn't exist probably, right? And so yeah. that's where I think ads are good. And I, I think also like, like here's like the stone cold, hard nosed web two ad tech boomer reality, right? For web three to get to a billion users on chain, and this doesn't exist now, and it's a major problem that I think about all the time. There has to be a way for me to turn money into users, like real legit, like users who care about my app. If that machine doesn't exist, we're not going to get to a billion users on chain. It's just not going to happen because you need to have some way to turn on. I launch a new app. I want the world to see it and find out about it. They want to find out about it. If they knew about the app, they would use it and would become recurring users. Something, something has to fix that, that, that disconnect. And yeah. we call that ads. And again, it doesn't have to be those little display ad units, but there has to be some form of targetable media that presents the user with a call to action in some form. Yeah. What do you think the onboarding solutions or the onboarding platforms is role in um in like tracking will be so like let me give you an example so like the first time ever someone ever downloads metamask right or like installs metamask metamask could drop you an nft in your wallet so that you and then anytime you trade on uniswap or you go into you bridge over to using axlar into like i don't know avalanche or something like that like that nft kind of sticks with you and that's like one form of non-chain cookie but it feels kind of like an obvious thing, but maybe like a really arcane, like we're thinking very, I don't know, web two model here. What, what do you think of that model? I mean, I won't comment on, on MetaMask specifically, but if you're asking me broadly speaking, Broad, wallets, broadly, um, not MetaMask, yeah, yeah. Just onboarding yeah. solutions and like their role in tracking and things like that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're top of funnel, right? Like I think wallets rightly are turning themselves into the portal for web three, right? If I go use Coinbase or MetaMask, like I can discover new dApps or NFT or experiences inside my wallet. And I think they should be because that, that's how users are getting on chain, right? In some form or another. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they're in some sense, yeah, they're top of funnel. And so like how, here's a, here's a random view from the trenches as well, right? When we launched Spindle, like we originally thought, right? Like dApps would use us the most to look up funnel, right? Like I'm a dApp, I'm doing things to make users love me, right? Like where are these users coming from? That's the pivot, me looking, towards the top of the funnel and pivot it by channel and pick out the fact that, look, BlockWorks actually drove this many users. Turns out some of Spindle's users are not dApps, actually. They're what you would call top of funnel. People who are, it's the first user's contact with the chain and what they care about is not how they got there. I mean, they sort of care about how they got there. What they really care about is, okay, what does the user do after me, right? What is the, like, <laughs> is mm. there some NFT collection or NFT marketplace out there that it turns out I'm driving a huge part of their revenue. I didn't even know it. I'm definitely not getting paid for it. Like, what is going on in the world, right? We call this eco internally. It's basically like, what is the ecosystem view of the part of the chain that I inhabit? And we have a decent number of, uh, of use cases in which that's exactly what they're looking at. They're looking down funnel. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think what we see going on, it's funny. I, my employees troll me so much because I've used a metaphor so often. They actually bought me one. But I often use a metaphor of like a voltmeter, right? Which if, <laughs> if you've ever had been in double E or whatever, it's like you're in a circuit, you put the two probes and you measure like the voltage drop on different points in the circuit. Part of what Spindle is, frankly, is sticking our little probes, <laughs> top of funnel and bottom of funnel, and seeing mm -hmm. how much money and people are actually transiting between those two points in the funnel. That's kind of what we exist to, to do. And sometimes it's the upper probe using Spindle, and sometimes it's the lower probe <laughs> using Spindle. <laughs> but measure, measuring we are. And the yeah. question is, once you measure, how do you establish some business relationship, i.e. some rational piece of value transfer that... Mm -hmm you know, makes that relationship, you know, deeper and more effective. Hmm. So what's the pitch for BlockWorks? How can like, if you were, if we were sitting in a room and we were thinking about using Spindle, like what is the, what is the low hanging fruit for BlockWorks to use Spindle? So you said you had a newsletter, right? We have newsletters. We have a, you know, nine podcasts. We have conferences. We've got the media website that, you know, millions of people read every month. Um, and we have ads across the whole business. So, I mean, podcast attribution is, is fascinating, but more complicated, right? Because it's audio Very and there isn't necessarily yeah. an audio call to action. It's a little bit different. And yeah. typically you have like, you know, Casper mattress, use, you know, referral code, blah, blah, blah. That's about the extent of it. But on more visual media, yeah, dude, sure. you could sign up for doing rev share referral programs with various DEXs and then run the link inside your newsletter as, you've, as you're already doing. And you could get paid for it. Um, I mean, you... You could put our SDK on your website and see where users are coming to you in a very Google, Google Analytics -y way. Are, is, are any of your properties like wallet aware? Do people log in with a wallet? Or, you know? um, our research platform 
is the only thing right now. If you own this NFT, you get access to it. But we've um, it's something that we've debated, which is like, do you put a wallet on your website um, to get really interesting? Like, like right now, you we have, we have Web two first party data on customers, okay. which is like, or on our readers, which is like, I don't know, like maybe here's your net worth, or like here's your actually that's not even really first party data is net worth. It's like, uh, you know, what is your job title? What is your company? Like things like that. What a having a wallet on our website would allow us to do is be like. This person's a power user of Ave and they read a lot of articles about like Bitcoin. Okay, we've got like yep. this weird Bitcoin maxi who like loves Ave. That's like a I don't know. That's why I like having a wallet attached to the to the website would be really interesting. So. The, well, that's exactly right. So that's our next question. So if 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 you do if you are wallet aware and you could fire us the wallet sync event, we could A give you interesting wallet profiles that would answer the question you just said if the person's a heavy Ave user or whatever. You could also see like, okay, did I drive the user to go do something? Like did I write like add a state of Ave? Just to, you dropped Ave, so I'm mentioning Ave. A state of Ave report, or a state of on-chain lending report, and somebody actually goes and does a bunch of on-chain lending, right? Like you'd want to know that, right? And potentially work out a deal. I mean, it's you're a journalist, so maybe you can't quite shell things quite so hard, or maybe you have to have separate sponsored content or something. But you'd like to understand, like, what is your impact, right? Like, what, how much how much stuff am I driving on-chain? Or if you do you do a review on base, it's like okay, how how many new use how many new base users did I drive? And how much in gas fees did I drive for, for Coinbase? You'd want to know that, right? It'd be interesting, potentially, if you worked mm -hmm. at a sponsorship with them or something. We could track yeah. that. Right? You, know who, you know who's going to... Someone's going to make a killing building like the nerd wallet for crypto. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. And you, got in that, in, they'll, you guys will be involved in that somehow. All right. Interesting, man. We're happy, we're happy to measure. We don't typically do like direct consumer-facing stuff just because I'm yeah. allergic to like, the consumer stuff. We're, we're here to measure. And to be clear, we don't pick sides. We'll measure any chain, work with any dApp. Like, we are data Switzerland. Like we don't pick winners or like have yeah. exclusivity with any DAP or anything. And everything we do is org scope. So we work with competitor A and competitor B. None of the data touches each other, any of that stuff. We're just yeah. here. We're just here to be the vault meter, so to speak. Nice. I like it. Yeah. Um, anything we missed about the crazy world of ads? Dude, I think it's amazing. And what? Uh, just over an hour, I think we covered everything. We answered every question in Web3 marketing. Incredible. <laughs> Ever. Or close Ever. to it. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. What do you think happened to CPMs? What, what will happen to CPMs in crypto over time? Here, because well, there's, two, there's two. Are, are like one In one world, advertisers outside. The only people who care about reaching crypto users right now are crypto people like or crypto companies. So in one world, uh, CPMs end up going much higher in crypto because non-crypto co uh, companies want to reach those crypto people either because yeah. they launch their own crypto things uh, or because they realize it's like a very affluent group of people who try new yep. technology, et cetera. So that drives CPMs higher. The other would uh, thing that would drive CPMs lower is, um, I don't know, like Bloomberg and w Bloomberg, like when Bloomberg Media was getting big, like they had like $100 CPMs, but now Bloomberg Media does not have $100 CPMs, obviously. And I think just as you get scale, CPMs go down. Um, I'm curious where you think that goes. Yeah, I know people cl are clearly um, targeting crypto audience. We, we partnered with a company called um, Addressable that does just that, right? They use blockchain data to target people on Twitter and stuff. And a lot of their advertisers, from what I understand, aren't even natively on chain, right? They just want to use blockchain data to, to target ads because mm. it is a rich. So I, I, I do think some CPMs definitely go up. And I think just, you know, tossing out random publishers, Etherscan, CoinGecko, CoinMicroCap, Dapp Radar, a lot of these crypto heavy sites, in my opinion, are probably under monetizing in terms of what they could be monetizing at if they had proper ads targeting and attribution. Of course, I would say that, but I, I, I do think their CPMs will go up in time as the ad set gets more sophisticated. Uh, but to your point, I do think there's some crypto media out there, I won't name names, whose rate cards I've seen and they're insane. <laughs> and there's no <laughs> way that media is worth that much. And if they were to put a spindle link on it and actually measure their value, I suspect the CPMs would back out to a tad bit less than what they're charging. But what do I know? I would love to do the measurement study to see what that is. But <laughs> Not naming names, huh? It's a supply and demand market, my friend. It's just a marketplace. And if there's more demand than supply. <laughs> Look, uh, real measurement is like when the tide goes out and you see who's wearing a bathing suit and who isn't. <laughs> yeah. That's what, me that's what measurement does. I did yeah. see that rate card the other day. I did. I have um, no idea what you're talking about, Yana. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> good pod, man. Good chat. Good pod. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's been entertaining, right? This is a... Uh, we're not going to make people go to sleep with too much ad tech chatter. We, we, we push the limit, but we're, you know, we're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So awesome, man. All right. We'll be well. We will uh, talk again soon.